Okay, so I think we will go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me. Uh, and good morning to all. My name is Jessica Davidson, and I'm the founder of Davidson Art Advisory, which is a boutique fine art consultancy that provides acquisition and art advisory services to private collectors, and also strategy and business development consulting to art and tech businesses. Um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this live discussion on architecture, design, digital art, and technology. And want to thank all of our attendees and panelists um, who are joining us from all over the world. Um, when the team at NEO asked me to organize and moderate this panel in collaboration with Barco Residential, I was thrilled. Um, I'm a big believer in the transformative power of art and have spent the last decade working in the New York contemporary art world. Um, and I'm also a proponent of artists who are engaged with new technologies and innovative mediums. So in our digital age, new media art is thriving. And this provides an exciting opportunity for architects and designers to enhance the spaces of their customers uh, with immersive and dynamic art experiences. So today, we are going to explore how to connect these dots between architecture and design and the art and technology that powers the new uh, designs. And we're going to hear from thought leaders and trendsetters in all of these fields to discuss a variety of topics. The topics will include new media and with a special focus on moving image art and its ecosystem. <laughs> We'll discuss art collecting trends in our current digital age, and we'll also touch upon the new normal, how the art world and the architecture and design communities have been impacted by COVID-19 and how this has impacted and accelerated the growth of this burgeoning art genre. So um, just a little housekeeping note, uh, attendees are welcome to type questions real time in the Q&A box, it's to the right of your screen. Um, we'll do our best to address these as they come up, or depending on how we're doing on time, we'll revisit them at the end of the panel. We've allowed some extra time for Q&A. We'll also be recording this panel and we'll distribute the link to everyone who registered and also attended um, so they can watch it. We'll also include a bit more information about the companies and the panelists so that folks can reach out to us directly if they would like. So I'm honored to be joined by a distinguished group of panelists. There are seven of you. And I'm delighted to introduce these folks virtually to everyone now. And I'll start with Steve Sachs. If you could give a little wave so we know. <laughs> so, hi, Steve. So Steve is the founder and director of Bitforms Gallery in New York. This is one of the leading galleries in the world focusing on new media art and championing artists critically engaged with technology. It's a phenomenal program and I've been a fan for years and years. Wonderful to see you. Quayola is a new media artist. Hello, Quayola. Um, represented by Bitforms Gallery, and he is engaged, highly regarded for his entrancing digital video creations. These challenge preconceptions about art and architecture and the concepts according to which sound, movement, composition, and color can interact two-dimensionally. Robert Tretch, hi Robert. <laughs> is a renowned residential architect and interior designer, and he's also the head of the Modern Studio at Harrison Design. Tim Garman, hello Tim. Tim joins us from the UK. He is the director of the custom integrator Live Smarter, which is a supplier of smart home solutions uh, for home homeowners and property developers. Um, we're thrilled to have Deborah Johnston with us. Hello, Deborah. Hi. And Deborah is one of Atlanta's top luxury real estate agents with Berkshire Hathaway. Her clients include entrepreneurs, Fortune 500 executives, and celebrities in the entertainment and film industry. Rob Anders. Hello, Rob. Hi, everyone. 
<laughs> Rob is the co-founder and CEO of NEO, the enabling platform for the finest digital art experiences across residential, commercial, and public spaces. We'll elaborate on that quite a bit in our discussion. Uh, Tim Sanava, hello Tim. Tim is the Managing Director of Barco Residential, which is part of the Entertainment Division of Barco, and he's recognized as a thought leader who champions new media art and the architectural digital canvas in high-end residential and custom integration industries. So, welcome to all of you. Thank you once again for being here, and let's dive in. So, to give a brief overview of, of digital art, um, and I'm going to ask Steve to, to go to dive deeper into it, um, but uh, to kick us off, you know, artists tell a story of the world that they live in, um, and they do so with the medium that best resonates with their audience. Today, as, as we know, we live in a digital age. This is defined by technology and the growth of the online world, and that's really um, significantly impacting and altering the way that we experience and consume art. New media art is a burgeoning genre, and this encompasses artworks created with new technologies that can range from virtual reality art, uh, moving image art, code-based art, artificially intelligence-generated art, among others. So, Steve, you founded your gallery in 2001 and have developed it into one of, and I would say the leading project in the world focusing on this genre. So, as a preeminent dealer in this space, can you elaborate on new um, on media art, maybe with a particular focus on moving image art, which is what we're going to be discussing today, and how you came to focus on and specialize in it? Sure, sure. Um... Well, thanks for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, well, it's it's been a long time. It's incredible. It's been almost 20 years now. So uh, as you were mentioning, uh, you know, artists are dealing with the uh, contemporary tools of their time. And 20 years ago, it was quite different. Uh, it was more about the introduction of the internet becoming much more prevalent in people's lives. And that was something that had an impact on, on the art world. And also back in around 2000, there were a number of big museum shows that were happening that were devoted to artists dealing with new media. One was at the Whitney, one was San Francisco, one was the Brooklyn Museum. So this captured my attention. Uh, this is when I was thinking about opening a gallery and I wanted to do something that was unique in the art world. And I felt that this trend towards artists, artists dealing with technology in both their practice and their presentation was going to be something that would be embraced by the art world. Um, what's interesting is actually, I mean, new media is a strange term really, because new media becomes old very quickly. So in the way my gallery operates is we work with artists from a range of generations. So each generation has their own, um, I guess, interpretation of the technology of their time. So I have artists who are 80 something years old who were doing things, again, new media based in the 60s and 70s. So it's important for me as a gallerist to show that there is a history. Um, I think it's important for the art world, it's very important for collectors to show that these things were happening, uh, experiments in the art world were happening many, many years ago. So we wanted to become experts in that area. Um, again, in 2001, I mean, it was completely different that even the screens that we used were, were clunky, they were incredibly expensive. And those were potential hurdles, actually, both for collectors and artists. So. So as, as time went on, uh, certainly for moving image work, which is what we're focusing on today, um, it really changed drastically in terms of accessibility, uh, ease of use, access, and it, it opened up that market tremendously. And uh, obviously people like Neo, I'm, I'm moving ahead many years, but, but Neo really, um, for me, it was something that we were always looking for, something to manage and, uh, you know, collect and distribute um, 
you know, screen-based art, which, which at the time back then, and even, you know, 10 years later was not so easy to do. So having um, that access to a platform that allows for collectors and artists to more easily present works on screen really was kind of a game changer for how um, moving image work can be collected and produced. Thank you. And and as you're as you're talking about sort of the consumption um, and and the collectability of of moving image art, you know what has been your impression of the evolution of the collector mentality? How they're acquiring it, um, how they're collecting it, and, and what trends are you sort of seeing um, that you might be excited about or eager to see how that. The, the screen, the computer, the players, the, the distribution system, all of this allows for the collector and the artist to uh, more easily enter this market. And because of those things, it has become much uh, easier for collecting to take place. And there's a higher comfort level. There's um, a much easier way to access the collection. Because remember, if you think about, you know, if you were collecting video art 30 years ago, it was a very different format that it's in today. So if you have a number of different formats, something like Neo can actually um, put everything in one location and make it one uh, universal format. And again, this easy presentation and, and even, of course, Barco having this, these incredible uh, technologies for presentation allows for a uh, much more seamless integration um, into people's homes and architecture. Absolutely. Thank and you. Obviously, you're seeing Tim is, is rotating through a number of um, my artist's works. The one you're looking at now is Raphael Lozano Hemmer. That work's actually an interactive piece that uh, Barco helped us present in uh, Art Basel in Miami. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, um, Quayola, um, as one of the artists uh, represented by Steve and, and Bitforms, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your practice, the inspiration for it, um, and, and your experience with, um, you know, deciding to work in this genre in the first place, um, and then how, uh, how it is being collected and consumed, and, and how you really want audiences to interact with your work, and how important that experience and um, experiential aspect is to your practice. Sure. Hi, everyone. I think I would start on how I actually started to engage with this technology, as I think it connects a lot with what Steve uh, mentioned about really uh, the technology, it's more like a context rather than, than a tool, let's say. It's the kind of context that, that we live in and something that is really uh, shaping this context in, in incredible ways, in, in good and bad, but certainly in, in ways that are so uh, prevailing and, and um, game changing in a way. Uh, so for me, there wasn't really a very clear decision. It's actually, I started using computer really when I was a kid and it was just an expression, a very natural expression about living in today's society. So I think the fact that there wasn't even a specific choice about using technology, it seems to me something so incredibly natural for someone who wants to experiment, to perhaps discover new languages, discover and look at the world and the new perspective that technology really offers these kind of uh, tools, both on the creating and creation of the artwork, but also on the, on the actual experience that you can, uh, that you can deliver. Uh, but I would say on what I do, there is also another sort of underlying thought on technology, which is really how technology is shaping us and really changing the way we look at the world. Uh, and that's mostly what I'm interested in, in somehow looking at the world with these technological apparatuses to try to distill and, and discover very new ways of seeing. And, by doing this, perhaps then discover very new languages and new aesthetics in the process. And um, I did so uh, by looking at uh, our heritage. Uh, actually, I do this by looking at history. It's a little bit of a byproduct of me growing up uh, in Italy, in Rome, and then I guess moving to London 
almost 20 years ago. So I, I think there's this kind of strange combination of opposites in my work. I'm very interested in looking at a certain kind of heritage, which could be um, an iconographic masterpiece, um, a painting, uh, a classical sculpture, or perhaps a topic like landscape painting and the representation of nature and so on. So there's several lines of inquiry in my work looking at these traditional topics, but with a very sort of, uh, uh, I guess, different approach and a very different uh, apparatus. And um, the result of these works vary quite a lot from physical objects, uh, like maybe these objects that is on the uh, on my back, it, it's, uh, it's a big print, uh, to videos and works that are emotion or let's say more ephemeral by, uh, by nature. I think something that is truly uh, important, and especially so on the video works, on these digital works, is their physical manifestation. Uh, it's actually the physical experience that ultimately someone has of these, these works. Uh, and for me, this is a crucial, um, something of crucial importance. And in fact, this is also why I am excited to be on the panel and, and excited to be collaborating with, with uh, various people on this panel from having shown works with Barco's technology and, and NEO systems and so on. Uh, really more and more looking into how ultimately these works can be delivered to, um, to the audience. And uh, I've been doing this on a, of course, on a large scale. For example, this photo that you see at the background was a large installation at Park Avenue Armory in New York. Uh, and, uh, and of course, also, I think using Bart's technology at the time, there's always been also focused on this, uh, you know, large scale kind of presentation. But I think what excites me at the moment is the sort of accessibility that, um, that people has of, uh, technology that can really come inside your home. And, uh, and I think this sort of offers a sort of unprecedented kind of connection with collectors, with audiences, with perhaps new types of collectors and so on, to really engage with this type of work. Uh, because I don't think you can just imagine uh, here that a video can simply be shown anywhere. I think you need the required infrastructure to be able to appreciate something properly, to be able to have that kind of experience that it's not just a little web, a little web video that you're streaming on YouTube, but it's actually it's a physical object that has a certain presence and can have a certain type of quality to it. Absolutely, and that that makes so much sense, and that was beautifully put. And you know, to that point, you're you're using these uh, more advanced creative technologies. The display technologies are more advanced. But a key part of this is that the, the next generation of, of art enthusiasts and collectors, they're really starting to adapt and embrace this. Um, but they want to do it in, in the most kind of genuine um, way and the way that the artist really intended them to experience and view the work. Um, so this is a, a great segue to, to talk about Neo a little bit more. Um, and Rob, you saw an opportunity to create a company that would make new media art and specifically moving image art more accessible. And, and the way to do that um, at a high level was enabling seamless access to this artwork. So, so tell us a little bit about Neo and, and how it achieves that. Oh, Rob, sorry, I think you're on mute. I think that was Stephen Sachs that made me go on mute. <laughs> so, thanks, thanks Jessica, for um, all of your work here on the moderating, you know, and, and building this context. Um, NEO was founded around about seven years ago between myself and, and my business partner, Oren Moshe, who's probably listening somewhere at the same time. And, and ultimately, I think building on some of the things that were said earlier by Steve and by Davide, um, on the one side, we feel that, especially in today's day and age, there is a need to actually reach and inspire the broadest possible audience in a way that's not been done before. In fact, a lot of people have a complex relationship with art. It's seen as exclusive and not for everyone. So you have the art collectors who they've appreciated the digital medium because it's very much an appreciated art form, but it's more complicated or it had been more complicated to access and to implement relative to putting a painting on your wall. And then there is the broader audience who are discovering art and 
maybe felt intimidated sometimes going to galleries and the business model was always about going and buying an expensive piece of work. And so we took all of this into consideration when feeling that on the one side, we had a deep desire to try and reach, connect and inspire people. And we think that, again, especially in COVID times, it's more important than ever that people have a chance to, to stop and to reflect and, and to have a moment to just maybe think. And I think that's a big part of art. But at the same time, we have artists around the world who have a unique viewpoint, stories to tell, who are very keen to showcase their work and also for that work to be accredited properly to them, to be played as they wish, and ultimately for them also to earn from their art. And so Neo wanted on the one side to empower um, and enable this community of artists and galleries who are working with them from around the world and enable their, world, their work to be seamlessly accessed by the broadest possible audience, which can break into you know, your traditional sophisticated art collector who's, who may be a little bit different from a, a high net worth individual who doesn't know art, but he wants the latest and the greatest through to everyone, the millions of people who have some type of cultural awakening and who appreciate art and they appreciate design. Um, you then wrap all of this from a business perspective into the fact that content sectors have gone digital in the last 10, 15 years and the likes of, of, of Kindle and iTunes and Netflix and Spotify have become these previously unknown platforms that are now these billion dollar unicorns that have basically brought together. And we saw a, an opportunity, but we understood from day one that art is, is different in its own form. Number one, you need credibility. You need to be embraced. And, and for us, we made a decision. We said, look, our approach is going to be a collaborative ecosystem and built upon, as Coyola said, an infrastructure. So that the moment an artwork is created, whatever that format might be, and we very much were keen to look at the most advanced forms of technology. So for us, we're talking about digital art being art that was created digitally to be experienced digitally. Still images and photography, video on one or multiple screens, interactive, code-based, generative, AR, VR, the, the, anything which artists are using digital tools to create. And we said the moment that these works are created, they should they live their entire life cycle on Neo. So when you're talking about storing these works, even before they're available, but for artists and galleries to store them, to preserve them, huge files. I mean, Quayola's files can be terabytes in size. Um, to be able to preserve these files and then ultimately empower that community to publish the works themselves so that they're always in control of what happens with their art and then build an infrastructure of technology to distribute and deliver that art according to the business models which have been defined by the artists or the galleries but ultimately to be played exactly as defined by the artist on any screen in any location with a kind of underpinned infrastructure to manage and to securely protect the work this was this was a vision and it was a big vision because we felt that we needed to stop credibility so it was not about let's just go to unknown artists on instagram but let's go from the guys at the top the Davids, the Stevens, and, and, and a number of others. And, uh, and, and, and that's what we did. And, and we were very fortunate um, to, on the one side, attract the support of some of the world's leading venture capitalists who see this as a huge business opportunity. But likewise, we also have the opportunity to be backed by some of the biggest art influencers of the world, the president of the Guggenheim, who sits on the board of the Tate and the MoMA. And it's these two sides coming together in a collaborative way, which we believe will give us the opportunity to take this to become a brand and an experience that can be reached, enjoyed, and accessible to everyone. And the final point I'll say before letting you carry on is that part of that infrastructure is not just about matching artists and the galleries to the audience, but it's truly taking away all the pain points for the architects and the designers who realize this vision by making sure that built into this ecosystem is that whole global infrastructure of hardware integrators and manufacturers so that when there is a vision to bring this experience into your space, it's simple, it's on demand and it's accessible for all. And that's why the relationship with Barco has been so important in, in recent years and with a lot of integrators that we're working with right around the world. So that's, that's, that's Neo and uh, I'm sure you've got more questions. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's wonderful. Thank you. And um, yeah, I think just echoing what you said, I mean, these these issues around accessibility and credibility are so important. 
in a traditional art market ecosystem, but I think particularly when we're talking about new media art where people have a bit more of a skepticism, where there's a bit more of a learning curve in terms of how it will work, how do I maintain the integrity of my uh, of my work, and, and, and once I see it, you know, how do I make it come to life? All of these questions, you've managed to kind of simplify that process and really drill it down into the experience and fast track between the artist's creation and the consumer's experience. So I think that's, um, that's incredible. Um, and in order for um, for the platform and, and for Neo's mission to really come to life, you need a digital canvas, which you mentioned. Uh, so I think this is a great opportunity um, for me to kick it over to Tim um, to talk a little bit more about the, the world of the high precision display technology um, and and some of the the variants of that that your company uh, Barco Residential uses to create these immersive experiences um, brought to life through Neo. Um, and and uh, showcasing the artwork of, of leading artists of today. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Uh, no, this art has been something for us that you know we were always interested in, and it's a it's a great experience when you look at the kind of customers and the kind of customers that uh, that our integrators work with. And it was almost a, a chance meeting a couple of years ago with Rob with Neo, where kind of a couple of things started to fall in place. Um, where of course you need you need access you need somewhere to to find these amazing works of art. Uh, that's what Neo did, and then you also need uh, the best possible way to show these works of art. And you know sometimes it's almost like a, a self fulfilling prophecy that you go to to a lot of um, galleries and you look at a lot of things, and and often they tend to use fairly standard panels or even TVs to to show this art. Um, and, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way that we're creating artworks because that's the canvas that's available and, and almost vice versa, right? Because if that's the only canvas that's available. That's what artists tend to create for. And for me personally, that kind of created an issue because uh, especially if you look at things like the, the, the 16 by 9 aspect ratio, it already creates a context in people's minds. Like when you see something in 16 by nine, people almost automatically think, oh, that must be a TV or a computer screen. So you already start with a context. And particularly uh, if you're not in, in the right context, like if you were, if you walk into Steve's gallery into New York, obviously there's a different context that's created there. You're not going to mistake it for anything. But in other situations that might actually um, not create the right context for the work of art or even devalue the work of art. Um, the second thing that was important for me was it also limits the, the artistic freedom of the artists themselves. It's almost like saying to, you know, if you would have said to Van Gogh, uh, you can paint whatever you want. It's just uh, your painting always has to have the, the same shape and we have four standard sizes that you can paint in, right? That, that's not what you want to say to an artist. So we kind of saw something missing there and said, well, we can actually bring something to the table here. Um, and I think the difference is that most companies like ours tend to focus very much on the technology, uh, not necessarily on the perspective of what is being done with that technology. So we tried and put ourselves on the other side and said, okay, from an artist's perspective, what is important here and how can we use technology to enable that? And so that's why I'm so passionate about, you know, freeing the artist from the limitations of size, aspect ratio, and basically say, create whatever your artistic vision leads you to create. Uh, and we will use the, the right technology to make that possible, which may not be the same technology in, in different situations. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that also in terms of pure quality, if you look at these really high-end works of art that someone like, like Davidi creates, and especially also from a from a collector's perspective, you want to be able to display that artwork the way it's supposed to be shown. You know, I, I've, I've seen certain works that look vastly different depending on the technology that they're shown on. Uh, even looking at things like, uh, you know, reflectiveness can take away depth. Uh, the other thing, and this was actually uh, one of the most fun things that I feel I did, uh, which we did with Davidi, a little while ago where we looked at um, different resolutions of LED panels and had some of his work created for it because sometimes people think, oh, higher resolution is better, uh, which is not necessarily true when you look at art because, you know, a resolution can translate into texture. Texture is a creative medium. Uh, and I think to Davide's own um, 
surprise, the the one that he said that he or the digital canvas that he chose for a specific work wasn't the highest resolution. It was the one that had the right texture for what he was looking for to to realize his creative vision. So that's very important from the artist's perspective. When we look at the architecture and design perspective, particularly in the high end market, we put a lot of focus on that because you know I don't think any designer or architect likes a big TV uh, in a room. And the bigger the TV gets, the, the bigger of a black hole, if you will, it becomes that doesn't actually contribute anything to the design. So similarly, what we try to do with architects and designers is say, no, just think of it as a digital canvas. Don't worry about the specific technology, just worry about how you want to use that in your design vision. And then we will enable that for you with the right technology. And then obviously also the, the people that we work with, um, the, the custom integrators, are also the perfect people to help address some of the challenges that Rob talked about. You know, this is not the same thing as buying a painting. You know, there are some technical challenges on how do you do this? How do you manage technological obsolescence and things like that, which are really, uh, you know, very real concerns to the art world. So I feel by bringing together the technology, bringing together that channel, then working with Neo, working with Davide, that's really connecting the dots. Uh, and so that's what we've been most excited about. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. And and you, you just realize what a collaborative process this really is. You know, each each player in this ecosystem needs to be kind of an expert. They need to have a vision. There needs to be a technical savviness. Um, a lot of components need to come into play. But then you have when you have all of those players in place, um, you know, kind of personified by the panelists in our discussion today, that's when the magic can really happen. And, um, and I think that's really important to, to highlight all of the, the roles that everyone plays and how perfectly they need to be aligned. Um, and so I that that's actually a nice segue to, to talk a little bit about how uh, once you have the artwork, you have sort of this this perfect um, display, you know, precision display system. You've identified the resolution, the scope, the space. Um, then how are how are you going to kind of reimagine this into the design of actual physical spaces? So you're kind of reimagining the the physical space within the context of this virtual world and this virtual entity. Um, so I'd love to get Robert's perspective on this because Robert, you are a renowned architect um, and you have clients at Harrison Design ranging from uh, traditional to ultra modern. And I'm curious to know how you think about the incorporation of cutting edge art, specifically this you know, moving image art into both your private and your corporate projects. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's interesting because all the all the people so far um, come rolling into my project and it's up to me to make it work in the final in the final uh, stage, isn't it? So no pressure. Um, but I love the fact I'm loving the fact that uh, the um, this new media Sorry, Stephen. Uh, this new media can explode out of the confines of the computer screen, right? Um, and become part of the architecture. Um, now, with that said, most of my clients are sort of traditional, the traditional art owners, right? They 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 come to me, and they'll have a, a mature collection. Um, oh, there's there's Jack. Um, and they'll have a mature collection, and it's up to me to design a space that can accommodate those pieces. Uh, but um, with the new uh, digital type artwork, the, the pieces themselves can become the architecture and the design, right? Um, that image you see there on the screen is the inside of a show house that we just completed recently for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. And that double, triple height space uh, in fact, is the, is the negative space of a traditional uh, gable roof. So there was there was a bunch of things happening there in terms of how, why that was the way it was, but it provided an unbelievable opportunity to paint the wall with many different types of, of, of things, as you can see what it looks like when it's just a blank wall. I've never been afraid of blank walls as a defining element in architecture, but now with people like Coyola 
and Stephen and Tim and, and, and Rob, we can now activate those blank walls um, as we see fit to complement the architecture or to even um, counterbalance it, which is could be an interesting element as well. Definitely. And that was interesting, the point you brought up about how typically clients come to you with an existing art collection and you sort of interpret and build the design around it. Um, and would you say that's true as well when we're talking about digital canvases, that it's important for that to be sort of incorporated into the conceptual phase of the design? Or is it okay for that to be um, kind of added and integrated at a later, later stage in that process? No, I think it's even more critical. Um, to get that into the beginning phases of the design. I mean, with traditional art, you know, if I don't design a if I don't design a wall big enough for someone's triptych, it may become a diptych, and we don't want that. But um, it would be even worse with a, the installation by someone like Coyola. I mean, I I can't go cutting half half his beautiful digital creation in half. So if someone comes to me and to us or to any architect designer and they have a specific need, um, one has to have the infrastructure there, uh, the smart technology for one, the cable and all the boring stuff that goes behind the wall that Tim loves, right? Um, the projection system, but most importantly, the surface, right? Um, I'm not so against um, TVs as Tim might think, you know. Part of me loves a human, just a monstrous TV to watch you know, sports on or something. But, um, but we need to provide, we need to provide that wall and it can't just be a random wall because we could take, we could take an interest piece from, you know, from one of Steven's artists or Coelho and we could literally mold the house around it, um, because I, I'm I'm constantly designing houses where there's a piece that the owner might have that's integral to a particular to a particular uh, viewpoint or axis. I'm doing a, a renovation now where the entrance we have to design a, a niche opposite the entry door for a small piece by uh, Tom Corbin, a small bronze. So even something as simple as a little niche has a lot of impact. You can't do that later. Um, now, of course, if you design something, if you design the house uh, and you have a niche, and they decide they don't like that bronze anymore. Well, that's a, a problem. There's a little more flexibility with digital media um, if you have a big enough wall or an appropriate location. That's right. That's that's a great point too. And um, when you think about the changeability of the visuals of artwork, I think uh, uh, digital art and and moving image art. If you subscribe to something, I know Neo has these great subscription plans where you can be rotating the artwork. As someone who personally, I've sold um, many pieces of traditional art, and the logistics and the changing it out and the storage and that can all be quite a um, uh, a major undertaking. So one of the things I love and I really um, champion to my clients is um, digital arts footprint is fantastic. And once you have these screens that are integrated in areas of your home where they're going to be prominently featured, um, you can change out the visuals incredibly seamlessly using platforms like Neo. So that's a, that's a great point as well. Um, that several of you were um, involved in the, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Designer Show House. And I wondered if, um, Tim, did you want to elaborate on that project a little bit more um, and discuss exactly what that was and and how it came about and how it connected several uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it was an opportunity, uh, you know, one of, one of the integrators that we work with said, you know, I'm doing something in this show home because sometimes, uh, you know, our channel is involved because there's some form of automation uh, or things like that. But I think the opportunity is sometimes missed that we can we can contribute something that can really be a design tool. Um, and that, of course, would require that you're, you're involved in the process much earlier so that an architect and a designer can really say, well, you know, how do I make this part of my vision and how do you enable that? And, I guess in this case, I got I got really lucky. I I, I went to the site with uh, with our integrator, 
um, I had the pleasure of meeting Robert. Um, you know, the, the home was still in, in wood frame, um, but fortunately, and in some cases, it, it's also unfortunate. I, I have this affliction that I can see what something could be, uh, and I don't necessarily think about what it takes to, to bring it there. But so I, I saw this wall, um, and I, I discussed it with Robert, and, and Robert was, was on board really quickly. Um, and none of that was really, oh, let's talk about the technology, right? We were just talking about uh, what we could create as an experience, and then we would figure out the technology because that, that's, a means, that's a means to an end. That, that's just how you, how you enable the experience. Um, and so the, the result was great. It was great to see uh, the impact of people just because it was, it, it was such a, a big impact um, within the house. It was such a centerpiece. And that's why I'm, I'm really excited to have Deborah on the on the panel as well, because, you know, De Deborah uh, is is selling the house. And I saw some of her posts on Instagram where she, where she reacted to the art, uh, which was great because, you know, Deborah walked into the house not expecting this or not involving this. So it was really great to see the impact on, on a professional that deals with uh, these types of clients all the time. So. That's why I, you know, I, I think we should hear more from Deborah on how it impacted her not having been uh, involved in the creation and how she believes this impacts her customers and, and the difference that it makes to a home like this. I'm so excited to comment on this because this is the first, I mean, incredible architecture, but to have this design, like you said, Tim, walk right in, you, when you walk into the space, you, you have three levels and you see this projection up on the wall that's changing and it takes your breath away. And it was very interesting to watch during the show when people came in and had the reaction. And when the projector was on, it created an, an incredible experience and it was also a, this this photo right here, well, before the monkey. Was that Jack? Anyway, this one right here, if the art wasn't on, this house was designed the way Robert designed it to work with the property, you can see the reflection from the pool up on the wall. So whether the, I mean, the art was one experience, and then to see this, it literally looked like a sundial throughout the day as the, as the reflection was moving across. So it was such a beautiful space. And then to add that element of art was really, um, it, it was just incredible. And you almost want to see it in part of every home. You know, uh, Atlanta's different than, of course, the West Coast. They've got a little bit more going on they're selling the dream out there. But Atlanta, there's a great opportunity to incorporate art with home automation. Absolutely, and Deborah, to, to build on that a little bit more, um, obviously, you know, you have your finger on the pulse of, of trends in the, in the high-end luxury residential market um, where you are. Can you talk a little about the importance of memory points, which I think is a term you've used, and, and sort of what the, um, what the influence and impact art has on the, on the commercial ability, on the sellability, on the, um, on the emotional impact that clients have when they walk into a home, if it has that versus if it does not? It, it's um, night and day difference. Because really, when I'm photographing and showing the best aspects of a luxury home, what I'm trying to do is really capture the experience and the lifestyle. So then when you have art as part of that, it takes it to the next level. So it, it is game changing in an environment versus no art. Right. Yeah, it's That's critical. Great. That's great. That's great. And, um, and I would love to hear, because we've talked about, um, um, you know, the architects and designers have a vision of the best implementation approach of this high impact uh, artwork um, that that has um, such a bearing on, you know, either 
in an existing home or um, the desire to purchase a home. Um, but I'd like to hear from um, Tim Garman because you, it's your job as the custom integrator to really tie all of these elements together and, and make the project come to life. So I'd love to hear um, sort of uh, about how you typically approach these uh, integrations of these types of art projects and, and what your experience has been um, so far. Mm -hmm. Digital canvases. One project did quite a number of years ago. I went to form a great um, to selling, uh, electronically frosting glass that we utilize for rear projection. The concept was to create a canvas for our client to actually display his art collection during dinner parties and also as a general kind of backdrop. You know, to the to the room itself, and that kind of sparked our interest in the in the digital canvas um, idea through different through different mediums. And each digital canvas has its own uh, unique properties. So, for example, with projection, you're always battling against other light sources, the amount of light you can emit from the projector, the projection surface, um, and the you know, the possible location and concealment of the projector. But it, that gives you a great canvas that so you can you know, really do some large scale um, projections on. And also when the projector's off, you're left with this, um, you know, the original surface you know, that you were projecting onto or digital projection mapping onto. Um, with other mediums like direct view LED panels, they're far more forgiving uh, of different light sources. But you've got to work out how that installation is going to take place. And also to create you know, something that's excessive, uh, excessively uh, um, pleasing and serviceable. In both of these, you've got to, you know, instances, you've got to think about how you're going to control both the natural light um, and also any powered light as well to make sure that the, uh, the artwork's actually displayed you know, how the artist intended it to be viewed. We approach each installation you know, with our kind of team that's built up knowledge through many, many years through um, and their backgrounds in acoustic design, projection and video design. So we, we, we take kind of a holistic approach to how we create you know, these, these installations. And do you, do you ever find a need to sort of refer back and, and have conversations with the creators, with the artists in terms of, you know, their, their intention of the display? Is there a dialogue there? Absolutely, because I think the, um, the, we've got to understand what the, you know, the original um, concept was and, it, and how it, you know, it you know, you know, was ideally meant to be displayed. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, well, I would say uh, thank you for that. And um, it, it's, it's so it's so fascinating. And for me in this process to understand how um, the role everyone plays in seeing uh, in making these projects really um, come to life. Um, I'd like to shift gears for a little bit in the 10 minutes we have left and just speak to what's kind of going on right now and um, and the impact that, that COVID-19 and um, how many of us are spending more time indoors, um, how this has um, changed the way that we think about art collection, art collecting and functional uh, design. And, um, you know, in addition to now being our living spaces, home is our office, it's our classroom, in some instances it's our gym and wellness center. Um, so Rob um, and Tim Sanave, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the challenges and also opportunities that has that have emerged as a result of COVID-19 and, and whether and if so how you're seeing acceleration in digital trends in the art market. Uh, okay, so I think it's interesting because the art world has generally been rather slow to embrace technology. Um, yet we're at a time and an age where this kind of huge acceleration in every aspect of our lives of digital has been kind of, we've seen a rocket 
go off in every aspect of our lives and the same has gone for the art world you know if we if we separate between the supply side and, and the audiences you have an art world which was very much a social experience with people traveling around the world art fairs were at the absolute core artists were obviously showing their works at fairs at galleries and museums and pretty much overnight this world has gone down um and yes there are some attempts to have some virtual online fairs and i think some of those are, are experience experimental um and so from the supply side what we're seeing you know and, and people like the serpentine gallery in the uk and others have actually released some quite broad strategy papers which basically say now more than ever is the time for the future ecosystem of art in fact we're talking about the future of how culture is experienced and art as a whole is experienced digitally and one of the big aspects there is this need for a unified platform which kind of underpins and enables and empowers that community to reach the audiences so we've been very fortunate on that side because we kind of pointed at because we took approach which was unique in terms of a lot of tools and professional tools for the artists and galleries so on that side it's been very it's been it's very very encouraging for us and we you know have thousands of artists and galleries looking to kind of join the platform even though we're we're you know we we are we're limited in who we bring in on the consumption side i think first of all the general move has been people are working less in offices and, and people are spending generally a lot more time in their homes uh, i think at the very beginning of covid people just didn't want to spend or do anything everyone was shell-shocked they didn't know what was going to happen even you know the ultra high net worth individuals like you know i've got the money i don't even know if the world's going to be here so they and then from kind of april may people were beginning to kind of you know they're putting much more time and focus into their home uh you know we've seen a lot of people who are working more from their home at the same time people are realizing that maybe we need to take a moment during the day once we've checked that our family are okay once we've looked at the covid numbers on the news and we actually just need that moment almost a moment of mindfulness a moment just to stop and just and, and to be able to bring that experience on demand into the home has been something which we've seen huge huge uh, demand for and i think further to one of your earlier points if as you're spending your time in the day whether it's in your home office whether it's with the family in the lounge whether it's a dinner party the ability to change at the click of a button the experience and therefore the environment has been something which the digital medium has anyway seen a huge explosion because it's a successful format in a digital in a digital form um, but when this becomes supported by business models or someone's typing um, but when when you see scenarios such as the fact that you're hosting people for dinner and you can literally at the click of a button loan or purchase a, a limited edition work which is worth tens of thousands of dollars and you're buying a very nice bottle of wine and you're bright and the click of a button for a for a month i'm i'm loaning this work and you can sit at the dinner table and say you know this work is one of six editions which is on my wall it all it all comes together so um obviously a lot of stress in the world and, and and a lot of people have suffered um and i think that's even more need for the opportunity for people to have a moment of a moment of art and uh, tim i'm sure you've got what to add as well yeah no i i think people are more focused of course and more attuned to the experience of being in their homes um and i don't think that's something that's that's going to be passing i think you know on all levels you can see that people have been putting investment into their homes because they're much more conscious on on the experience of living there and, and art can be a fantastic um a fantastic addition and you know i we were talking to robert earlier about you know have people's um demands changed of course uh in, in robert's case there's a long lead time when you have a design so it's probably a little bit too early to to see whether it's really coming into the design um, but this is, for example, Deborah. I don't know if 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 you see a change in, in what people are expecting from their living spaces, because you would be much closer, of course, in terms of in terms of lead time to to people's needs in the market. Uh, I've seen it, and I was smiling when Rob was talking through the timeline of you know what happened in April and May, and then you know people stopped and did some reflection in June. And then in July, the roof blew off and sales, particularly in the luxury market, but really in all price points, when people came to the realization that life is different and, and where they're spending time and how they're spending time created a 
real estate transaction and times that by hundreds of thousands of transactions and the market uh, here in Atlanta and I know in other major cities and yes. in, in the luxury market um, in July and August off the charts because people's lifestyles changed. And so they want something different. They're spending time at home. And so I, I mean, I feel like I'm on the forefront of all of that that is happening right now. And it's still happening. It's huge shift. That's, yeah, fascinating. And to see how it's going to continue to evolve. It will be interesting yeah. in the next yeah. couple of months and with the year rounding out. Um, it's very well, interesting. And I think about the properties that I have recently closed all have, for example, they feel more like a compound, and which may not be square footage, say it's maybe more land, or maybe more private, or maybe has a pool and spa, you know, things that now people are spending more focus on. All of that has pretty much sold. Wow. So it really ties with what you're talking about. Yeah. It's almost bringing the bringing the a, a museum uh, experience to the home as well. Yes. <laughs> Another layer. Well, you know, and if people are at home reflecting, and what do they want more art? Probably. I mean, or you know, the, the, there there's a lot of work going on in beautifying existing homes. You know, or because they're just creating that environment. Right. And perhaps sometimes instead of doing a massive, you know, renovation, if someone wants to change sort of mood or ambiance and yes. art can, can achieve that to a certain degree, something that's yes. very soothing or calming or transcendent, um, it, it can have that impact. So that's very interesting that you're seeing that. Oh, 100 percent. And, and we do have a question um, from uh, an attendee. Uh, from Daniel Ambrosi, who's actually a, a phenomenal artist himself. He, he's asking about um, the, um, on the equipment side, the micro LED panel options. And, and are these getting to price points and resolutions suitable for residential um, design? I guess, Tim, if you'd like to perhaps address that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe I won't address the price point because that's, of course, something that can you know depend very much from situation to situation. Other than in general, uh, those price points have been coming down as, as technology always does. Um, but I, I think the exciting point here is that you know in some other areas uh, of our industry, people are talking from the perspective of you know is micro LED going to replace projection or vice versa. I think what we're talking about here in terms of new media art shows that they are very complementary technologies and really depend on what you want to do. What we did at the Atlanta Show Home, for example, we couldn't really have done with micro LED. Um, and then I'm not even talking about the logistical issues, but just the fact that, you know, when the art wasn't active, then you would have had a huge black hole in the middle of Robert's, uh, Robert's fantastic design. But the other thing that I find really interesting is, you know, when you look at some dedicated um, uh, canvases, and particularly if you want to play with shapes and aspect ratios and things like that, then obviously micro LED gives you a lot of freedom. Um, but the other thing, as I alluded to earlier, is the fact that, you know, with Conventionally, people always think higher resolution is better. Um, what I was talking about earlier that we kind of experimented with, with Davide, on seeing what is the impact uh, when you look from an art perspective and you look in direct ULED, you can create a very unique canvas because you know you play with the dot pitch. Um, direct ULED is non-reflective, so it can actually create a lot of depth and texture. And it's not a question of the highest resolution is the best. It's a question of what type of uh, canvas that we create using micro LED really represents what the artist did and you know I'm, I'm still hoping to to find the time to write a white paper about that uh, together with Davide um, to, to really talk about that because I think that that's really absolutely critical because texture is relevant as a as an artistic tool or as an artistic medium and, and micro LED lends itself uh, very well to that so 
Um, I would say yes, you know, micro LED provides uh, a, a really exciting option to create some of these things in the home. Um, and it's ever more affordable. But of course, it, it tends to be on the high end uh, in any case. And the other thing about price point is, um, you know, if, if you invest in, in a wonderful work of art, then you also want to make the investment to show that artwork the way it's supposed to be done, right? Um, you know, I, I sometimes compare this to, to going to a custom tailor or something like that and saying, you know, I'm paying a lot of money to, to have a suit cut. I'm paying a lot of money to have it designed. Um, when it comes to the final stage of choosing the fabric, you don't want to choose the, the, the polyester because then you're also wasting your investment. So, you know, everything has to be right. Um, and also from, from the artist's perspective, obviously, you know, artistic freedom, but also showing the work the way it's supposed to be is, is critical, not only to the artist, but, but of course, also to the collective. I, I also wanted to add like something on, on this because um, the, the, the things and tests that, that we, we did at Barco and, and I mean, I've worked with LEDs a lot before, but I think having the time to really try to understand a little more how to work uh, with, with, with this type of technology, not only on a, on a very big and bright scale, but actually on something that is indoor that you might wanna, wanna live in. Something that, that we, we discovered, uh, well, through many things, but, but one particular point that really stick to my mind is the, is the brightness. As you imagine, uh, you have this image of LEDs as something very bright, intrusive, but actually, uh, the fact that this now this sort of uh, color gamma of these of these panels gets so rich, you are able to even use them at lower brightness, and perhaps calibrate the brightness, you know, with some sensors depending on how bright the room is and stuff like that. And you, it's a bit like having a painting, for example. If the light gets darker, the painting will get darker as well, in a way, and and so on. And LEDs really provide. Uh, the, 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 this type of control that really it feels like living with painting, with something that is hanging on a wall. It's not a very intrusive light emitting object. Uh, and, and the fact that it's matte, that it's not super gloss, allows again this black to be a real deep. And, and it's just something quite, quite different. So, of course, it's a very high end you know, complex installation sometimes. However, I do believe it works also on a small scale and it's the only thing today that really feels like a painting, I would say. And that's, I think, quite Great. Well, just a few minutes um, past noon. Um, so I would, I would like to once again, thank all of our panelists. This was a, Thrilling discussion, um, really enjoyed it, really appreciated everyone's input and points of view. Um, as a reminder to the attendees, we'll be following up with an email um, with a link to the video in case you missed part of it. Um, and that will also have contact details for our panelists. Um, and there is a special offer um, for participants of this webinar, you guys, um, for discounted pricing for showrooms um, through NEO. So I know the sales team there would be delighted to hear from you if you have questions on different subscription options and partner program. Um, and I guess if anyone has any final closing thoughts, feel free to share. Um, I'll just say one thing, Jessica, and thanks again for moderating and for everyone else joining. It's, 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 it's so important to bring um, everyone together and see how this thing comes together. And I think, and I think my lasting comment would be to everyone that's watching, um, this is, this is at this time in the world is about bringing inspiring experiences to people everywhere. And I think everyone that's part of that is not only good for business, but it's, it's also good for our responsibility of what we bring into community and, and for society as a whole. And I think the only way that this medium, which is at the absolute tipping point, of taking off, is going to go mainstream in the way it is, is for everyone here, not just all the, but all the architects and designers, all the hardware manufacturers, all the artists, all of the integrators coming together and actually being involved and contributing to the definition of standards, which enables this experience to be inspiring and accessible and enjoyed by people around the world. 
And I think more now than ever, the need to collaborate is what's going to be so critical. So thanks everyone for for listening, and uh, obviously, you know, from our perspective, we're keen to keen to work with you all. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you everyone again, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Jessica. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.